Hello, good day. You joined Deep Dive Workshop number six, the relevance of energy efficiency. Uh, on your right side of the live stream, you can see boxes of Q&A and polling. Please use them. Also, full agenda and biographies of all speakers, as well as slides of all presentations, will be down. If you scroll down, you may find them. I'm very pleased to introduce a uh, welcoming address will be provided by Ki Yung Nam. Um, he is principal energy economist from the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department of the Asian Development Bank, where he con uh, conceptualizes development of the energy sector strategies and policies and advises in the formulation of the energy sector lending and non-lending pipeline of the projects. Thank you, Dina. Thank you. Uh, let me start. Mr. Tetsushi Sorobe, Dean and CEO of Asia Development Bank Institute, and Ms. Clotilde Rossi Tishuyo from Sustainable Energy for All, distinguished panelists, colleagues, and participants, a pleasant day to all. On behalf of ADB, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this deep dive workshop on the relevance of energy efficiency in Asia and the Pacific. Today, our partner organizations, ADBI and se all have put together for us two very, uh, two very relevant discussion sessions on energy efficiency. The first will focus on the relevance and financing of energy efficiency, specifically in building and industry. And the second will showcase the experience of the 3% Club, an initiative of international partnership and governments in setting ambitious energy efficiency goal to achieve SDG goal seven by 2030. The panel will also be joined by ADB's Youth for Asia, highlighting how the youth can be engaged in the implementation of energy efficiency projects. The importance of energy efficiency to meeting the energy and economic challenges of the region cannot be overemphasized. As more countries commit to the high ambitions of net zero emissions by mid 21st century, energy efficiency becomes an essential tool for meeting energy demand and committed climate goals. Part of the strategy to accelerate low carbon transition is to treat energy efficiency as the first fuel that can reduce the overall cost of energy supply generation and of mediating carbon emissions while accelerating social economic development, enhancing energy security, creating jobs and improving overall quality of life. The ADB has long been financing energy efficiency measures to reduce energy demand and system losses. Over the past, over the last five years, the ADB investments in clean energy accounted to 8.5 billion US dollars. And of this 3.6 billion or about 42% were invested in energy efficiency. This included demand side energy, uh, demand side investment for an energy uh, efficiency improvements and energy savings in projects from agriculture and natural resources, transport, urban and water sectors, including the use of efficient household lighting replacing incandescent lights, more efficient agricultural water pumps, and using LED street lighting. On the other hand, financing for supply side energy efficiency measures comprised of efficiency improvement, energy savings from cutting down system losses on the grid. Moving forward, ADB recognized the need for further accelerate its effort in promoting energy efficiency solutions for its developing member countries. In keeping with its strategy 2030, ADB will promote energy efficiency alongside the use of renewable energy resources to strengthen ADB's effort in realizing a low carbon future for Asia and the Pacific. Investing in demand side energy efficiency in buildings, industries, and households as well as in transport and assisting in the adoption of digital technologies such as the artificial intelligence will boost the bank's clean energy transition response. On the other hand, ADB will continue to foster the supply side energy efficiency with the upgrades to and re replacements or new utilities using renewable energy resources. 
In closing, allow me to convey my appreciations to our co-organizers, ADBI and SC4, for ably, ably, ably organizing this workshop to our distinguished panel of experts for sharing your profound, profound knowledge and experience, and to all our participants for your keen interest. I look forward to an insightful, stimulating, and interactive discussions with the hope that the knowledge you gain from this workshop will encourage and lead to concrete energy efficiency actions in the future. Thank you very much. Nam, thank you very much for providing welcoming remarks and also for this opportunity to contribute to Asia Clean Energy Forum. I would like to invite uh, for providing opening remarks, uh, Titsushi Sanobi, who is Dean and CEO of the Asian Development Bank Institute, uh, the Tokyo-based think tank of the Asian Development Bank that promotes the realization of prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable Asia and the Pacific through policy research and capacity building. Thank you, Dina. Good day. Welcome to the Asia Green Energy Forum 2021 and the Deep Dive Workshop 6 on the relevance of energy efficiency for Asia and the Pacific. ADBI is pleased to co-organize this DDW in collaboration with our excellent co-partners, including ADB and Sustainable Energy for All. It's my great pleasure and honor to provide welcome remarks on behalf of the ADBI and the co-organizers. I'm also pleased to have the opportunity to listen to the distinguished speakers and moderators. This deep dive workshop has a timely and relevant theme as energy demand grows in developing Asia and Pacific. Energy efficiency holds the key to the success in meeting the growing demand in sustainable manner and preventing catastrophic climate change. Every efficiency, uh, sorry, energy efficiency is as vital as conventional sources of energy, since the enormous quantities of fuel can be saved by higher efficiency, and hence it can be called a uh, fast fuel. In addition, Energy efficiency improves energy security, economic competitiveness, air quality, and public health, and lowers greenhouse gas emissions and mitigates climate change. Yet many challenges exist and make it difficult to reduce the energy efficiency gap or the wedge between the optimal level of energy efficiency and the actual level. Energy efficiency depends on technology and human behaviors. Human behaviors depend on individual decisions, habits, and also on how other people behave. Influences from other people seem to be substantial. So there are a lot of externalities. Technology development is costly and its benefits dissipate uh, widely and thinly. Technological knowledge and the knowledge about human behaviors are public goods. So there are a plenty of reasons why market fails and why efforts of individual persons and the individual companies to improve energy efficiency are far from enough. Important roles can be and should be played by local communities, governments, and the international communities. Therefore, the good design of policies and the effective implementation of such policies are essential. And the financing energy efficiency investment must be innovative. Because good policy planning and effective uh, implementation, as well as uh, financing uh, energy efficiency, require knowledge and experience and imagination. We are here in this deep dive workshop today to share them. To have truly fruitful uh, knowledge sharing, I encourage everyone in this room to actively uh, participate in the deep dive workshop by typing your questions. 
We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can during the session. Your questions will also guide our future work on today's important topics. We greatly appreciate your participation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sushi Sanobi, for providing welcoming remarks. Um, I would like to remind everyone that Q&A, you can type on your top right corner and also polling, you can participate. All the biographies, agenda and slides you can find if you scroll down. I would like to introduce our first session, which is understanding the relevance and financing of energy efficiency in buildings and industry, which will be hosted by, uh, moderated by Clotilde de Rossi de Schio. She is senior specialist um, at the S S Sustainable Energy for All. Uh, she is, um, um, uh, she specializes on energy efficiency as well as cooling at Sustainable Energy Forum. Thank you very much, Dina. And uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, so in, I will start then introducing the speakers of the coming panel where we will be presenting about energy efficiency in building and opportunity in energy efficiency development in Asia and the Pacific as well as the importance of meaningful youth involvement when promoting energy efficiency measures. So let me start with introducing Beck Dina, who has been also our Master of Ceremonies. And um, Dr. Dina uh, Anskalieva is a research fellow at the Asia Development Bank Institute. And before joining the ADBI, she worked a research fellow at the Energy Studies Institute, the National University of Singapore and uh, as research fellow at the University of Reading uh, in the UK, uh, as well as um, a teaching fellow at the University College in London. Thank you, Dina, for joining us today. Thank you very much. So this presentation will be about using green bonds for financing green buildings in Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. Many of you probably have heard already about green bonds. So briefly, I will just explain. Uh, green bonds are financial instruments, just like conventional bonds. And the main difference is that they can be used only for financing green projects. Now, what a green project? The definition depends on the green bond principle or standards which you are using. Um, most of them quite similar and include renewable energy projects, green buildings, uh, electric vehicles and um, other projects, including also climate change adaptation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, what's interesting is that if we compare Southeast Asia and globally, that um, um, similarity is that two projects are top projects in financing using green bonds, energy and green buildings. But the big difference comes with green buildings. Nearly half of green bonds in Southeast Asia are used for green buildings, while globally it's only one fifth of the green bonds used for green buildings. I think the main reason for that is due to climate, tropical hot climate in Southeast Asia, uh, where energy efficiency improvements in buildings will lead to great uh, impact on energy bills, electricity bills, for example. Um, so among Southeast Asian nations, uh, next slide, please. Five countries uh, issued green bonds. Those are Indonesia, Singapore, Philippines, Thailand, and Malaysia. Indonesia is the largest issuer among these countries. This is because government of Indonesia issued a uh, few times very large values of green bonds. Also annually, annual issuance of green bonds grows in Southeast Asia every year until 2020. Uh, it started in 2017 only recently. Uh, however, still a share of Southeast Asia green bonds globally, it's below 3%. Next slide, please. Uh, now, if you look at who are issuers of green bonds, uh, we can see that Southeast Asia and the rest of the world are quite similar. 90% of all green bonds are issued only by free sectors, government, utilities, and financials. Uh, if you look at the green buildings, many might think that they are issued by real estate, right, mainly. However, it's not the case for Southeast Asia. We can see that real estate accounts for only 6% of issuance. This is, means that in Southeast Asia, 
green bonds, uh, green bonds for green buildings are issued not only by real estate, but also by other sectors like banks. And even we have one example of university, National University of Singapore issued green bonds for financing green buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, now let's look at two countries, Singapore and Malaysia. What's interesting about them, that large share of green bonds were used for financing green buildings in both countries. Uh, so it, around half, half of green bonds were used in these two countries. And both countries attra attracted a large number of private issuers, which is also important. Uh, how this happened, uh, what, what, what were driver of this uh, green bond issuance for green buildings? So I'm trying to discover, and this is still early, early stage. Um, I'm looking for your feedback and comments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the drivers, I think, were green bond grants. What are green bond grants? Please don't confuse with technology grants. These green bond grants are provided for funding of the reviewer cost. Labeling green bonds is costly. Comparing to mm, conventional bonds, uh, there is additional cost for labeling them, which includes uh, paying to external reviewers uh, for, to certify these bonds as green. Um, so these grants uh, can cover 90 to 100 percent of the cost with a cap of around 70,000 US dollars. Initially, they were introduced in 2017 in Malaysia and Singapore. And after, soon after that, uh, countries started to receive issue, issuances in these countries. So we can, uh, after such a great success, actually initially, uh, policies were introduced for only three years, but after such a great success, uh, these policies were extended for longer period and also were expanded and covering now more bonds. And uh, there is some differences in eligibility. Next slide. <clears throat> Another important uh, thing to have for, for this financing green bonds, green buildings, uh, green, bond uh, green building standards. Um, if, if you want to issue green bonds to finance green buildings, unlike other projects, green buildings require a certification. So you need to have a certificate of green building. It could be most, most of green bond standards, they agree that it could be regional, national, or internationally recognized standards. So could be any, any, any standards. They, they accept regional, national, and internationally recognized. Next slide. Now, looking, if I look at the, which standards were actually used, uh, very interestingly that they didn't use just one standard for green building. Uh, they used a combination, several. Uh, most of issuers used internationally recognized. And in addition to that, several internationally recognized and in addition to that uh, national they are all national uh, green uh, building standards so for example in singapore we use singaporean green building standard in philippines philippines uh, and so on so i think this uh, availability of national uh, green building standard also important uh, as well as a cost of labeling uh, green building and green bonds next slide Uh, so here I provide um, uh, some links useful, which I hope you can access to get more information. And hopefully this research will be uh, published in the book which we plan and call for papers is open for anyone to submit. Uh, to sum up, I want to uh, conclude that uh, pol policies which help reducing the cost of labeling green bonds or green buildings uh, will be helpful, especially for first-time issuers, because for first-time issuers, cost is higher and risks are higher. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tina, for uh, your presentation and for your insights on the green bonds. And um, I see already there are some questions coming up. Please keep the questions coming. We will be addressing them in the panel discussion right after the next two presenters. I would like to introduce now uh, William Hudson, which, who is leading the Carbon Trust work in Southeast Asia, where he supports uh, regional governments to deliver low carbon policy and regulation, works with financial institutions, as well as with corporate organizations. Uh, Will, William Main's focus uh, for the past two years has been uh, the design and delivery of energy efficiency component of the UK government uh, 15 million pounds Asian low carbon energy program. 
This three-year three program is focused on opening green finance and energy efficiency markets in Asia with outcomes including strengthened policy and regulation, an improved business environment and a robust pipeline of investment grade projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clotilde. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to speak this morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, so my name's Will Hudson. So as Clotilde mentioned, um, I'm leading on the energy efficiency component of the UK government's ASEAN Low Carbon Energy Programme. So that's the subject for today. Um, and I'll be focusing mostly on industrial energy efficiency. So we've heard a little bit about buildings and green bonds, um, but mostly industrial energy efficiency, which is the focus um, of our programme. Next slide, please. Yeah, so just a quick agenda. So just to, I'm going to talk briefly about the programme and give a bit of, a, bit of a, an overview of what we've been doing. Um, I'll then talk about barriers and opportunities to energy efficiency in ASEAN at a high level. Um, and then a little bit more of a deep dive on the challenges and opportunities around financing energy efficiency in particular. Um, then a few case studies, very brief, um, and the next steps around what we're doing on our programme. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this gives an overview of the programme itself. So as Clotilda mentioned, it's a £15 million aid programme. Um, it lasts for three years. Uh, we're around two years into the programme now, so a year to go. Um, there are two key components. So one is green finance, and the other is energy efficiency. We're looking to open up the markets in those two areas across the region. Um, there is a bit of overlap between the two work streams. So energy efficiency finance is increasingly a focus um, for us. So the Carbon Trust is leading on the energy efficiency aspects and we're partnered with EY, who are leading on the green finance aspects. Um, we also have IMC Worldwide who are helping us to mainstream gender and inclusion considerations into the programme. Um, and broadly, we're looking at a few different areas. So one is policy and regulatory support. Uh, so working with governments around the region to assist with energy efficiency policy uh, and particularly deep diving on uh, regulations around product standards. So trying to mainstream minimum energy performance standards for various product types, particularly electric motors. Um, and also we're doing quite a bit of work on sort of general awareness raising um, work linked to data. So trying to improve the data availability um, linked to energy consumption in different um, sectors or economic sectors across the region. And finally, looking at pilot projects. So um, we've, We've learned as we've gone along that seeing is believing in ASEAN, so it's important to do demonstration projects um, and they can help um, yeah, develop pipeline, um, which is required alongside the finance, of course. So we're working in six countries, so Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam. Um, the primary goal of the programme is to yeah, increase energy efficiency and the adoption of low carbon energy. Um, using green finance, um, we have a secondary uh, objective, which is to promote trade across the region as well. So that's a little overview. So next slide, please. Yeah, so as part of the programme um, at the beginning, we conducted a six month inception phase, which essentially involved analysing the EE market in each country that we're working in. Um, so we used a standardised market assessment framework, and you can see an image of that on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, so I won't go through all of these different aspects, but together they form an ecosystem, which is what is needed to open up the EE market. Um, no country covers off all of these things um, perfectly, um, but I would say that in ASEAN there are particular gaps in, in almost all areas, um, so lots of work to be done. Um, so we have focused as I say, on policy regulation um, on better data linked to better awareness of the size of the EE opportunity. Um, but we've also looked at the availability of capacity, skills and technologies across the region. Um, and we've looked at the availability of finance as well. And there are some key barriers. So these are applicable in almost all countries, but they're, they're, they're common to, to ASEAN as well. So fossil fuel subsidy, energy prices being very low in many cases, and with one or two notable exceptions, particularly in the Philippines, um, that really damages the case for energy efficiency, um, the business case for different projects. Um, EE project sizes are smaller than renewable energy projects um, and other large infrastructure projects, um, and that can be unattractive. And so 
um, investors may not be interested in projects that are sort of less than a million dollars each. Um, and they, they form this kind of, or they sit in this kind of valley of death. So not quite smaller, small enough for micro investors and not quite big enough sort of mainstream investors. Um, so project aggregation is needed um, and it is something that's lacking in ASEAN. Um, businesses themselves tend to focus on their core business. So energy efficiency is regarded as something that's risky. Um, to something that might not be something they're very familiar with um, and, and accordingly, um, yeah, not something to invest in. Um, perceived risk is quite high, even though the business case may be very strong. Um, and then finally, the absence of this ecosystem. And as I mentioned, so all of these different components of a robust EE market are essential. Um, and often, if just a few of them are missing, the entire system can break down. So this ecosystem approach is really important. Um, so that's something we've been... Um, trying to work on as best we can with uh, the limited resources that we have, but adding value um, with interventions that can contribute to a stronger ecosystem in each country that we work in. Um, some of the key opportunities, so I've mentioned better data. Um, I think comprehensive policy and planning um, is something that's essential. So using um, best practice EE policy and regulation from around the world. Um, so that's something we've been trying to deploy as best we can in various countries. Um, I mentioned that we've deep dived on energy efficient products, so products being a sort of least cost, um, highest impact policy option for driving EE at scale. Um, so driving up standards of energy efficient products, both minimum standards and high standards um, for, for products and attaching incentives um, and penalties to those standards um, accordingly. And then EE finance, um, as I mentioned, is, is a focus area for us. Um, and then again, I mentioned pilot projects, but developing innovative business models that can deal with the local context in each country um, and using those models to, to try to achieve scale um, within the private sector. We've done a lot of work with um, ESCOs and ESCO markets in particular. Next slide, please. Yeah, so on financing energy efficiency, so a little bit more of a deep dive. So. Yeah, there is a broad toolbox of different instruments and mechanisms that can be used. So you can see some of them on the right hand side of the slide. Um, and these can be combined in different ways um, and tailored to local context in each country in an, in an appropriate way. So in ASEAN, we tend to see that uh, lower cost uh, financing options are preferred to begin with. So things that can um, yeah, be delivered relatively cheaply. So for example, um, maybe it'll be a tax rebate for an energy efficient product. Um, maybe it'll be a market-based mechanism which doesn't require large scale funding, but can, can help incentivize uh, movement in the market. Um, one example from the UK, um, which hasn't been deployed in this region would be the climate change levy. So that would be a tax on industrial emissions. Um, and the proceeds of that tax um, can be used to fund energy efficiency. Um, and, and fund various activities to support the market. So that can be done relatively cheaply for governments. Um, and, and obviously, as, as you move sort of ahead um, in, into mainstreaming energy efficiency more broadly, more expensive funding options are needed. Um, so this is where multilateral funds can be helpful. Um, but I would say that, yeah, it's a journey. So you, you tend to start with grants um, to try to kickstart the market. Um, and then you move to um, yeah, subsidized loans um, and slowly bring in the private sector support to, to mainstream some of these instruments. And increasingly, there are really interesting new instruments being deployed around the world. So things like energy savings insurance, um, uh, new types of guarantee. Um, and, and many of these can be appropriate for, for the ASEAN regions. This is something we've been looking at within our program. Um, and just to wrap up on this slide, so kind of three main areas where um, well, for three main reasons that EE finance activities are often used. Um, so one is reducing that associated or perceived risk with EE projects. So often the risk is perceived to be larger than it really is. Um, so EE risk assessment frameworks that can help quantify those risks um, and make them manageable and make them, um, yeah, financeable um, is something that can be very helpful. A second reason is developing sort of self-sustaining markets. So as I mentioned, kickstarting the market with various instruments, but then bringing in the private sector to, to develop the market in the future. And then finally, overcoming capital barriers in general. So where EE is perceived as too expensive or where there's just a lack of available cash, um, then 
their funding is needed. But that is something that is not necessarily a barrier in ASEAN, where we know that the, the banks are typically flush with capital, um, just not able to channel to EE uh, projects a lot of the time. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this is um, just a concept for what we call a one-stop shop for energy efficiency. So I mentioned this ecosystem approach. Um, so financing is not the full story. So finance is essential, but you need plenty of other things um, to enable EE projects to be deployed at scale. Um, so one, one idea that's been used in the UK as well, um, which is actually the Carbon Trust model in the early days of the Carbon Trust 20 odd years ago, was um, a one-stop shop for energy efficiency. So essentially providing awareness raising activities, um, sizing uh, opportunities for EE in different economic sectors, um, but then backing, that, backing up that awareness with technical advice. So engineers that can help design projects, um, but also provide um, accreditation to different actors in the market and bring confidence to the market. Um, and then backing up the projects that have been designed with the finance um, and that can all be done under one roof. But one, one consideration is that this often um, needs to be outsourced from government to some extent. So you can have a trusted actor that sits between the private sector and, and government. Um, and this isn't something that's been seen in ASEAN to date, um, but is an interesting concept that um, could help um, push the market for, for EE in the future. Next slide, please. Yeah, so just a few case studies of the work that we're doing through LSEP. So um, the first one in Indonesia, so we're currently working with PTSMI. So they're a inf well, government-owned infrastructure investment bank, um, and they um, are looking to develop an EE loans product. Um, so we've been assisting them with developing a manual for that product. That will give them a sort of operational basis to get started with implementing those loans. And we've also started to develop a risk assessment framework for assessing um, EE projects um, for, for, the, for the bank. Second example in the Philippines, so we've been working with the Department of Energy um, around developing guidelines for developing government energy efficiency projects, so projects in the public sector, um, and in particular providing guidelines that overcome some of the typical barriers to developing government projects. So they're normally around procurement, contracting of third parties and, and budgeting. Um, and we've been working to address those barriers, um, including for um, getting third party ESCOs involved in delivering those projects. And then finally, an example of a demonstration project that we're working on in Thailand. Um, so this is all around a scalable um, energy efficiency business model, um, looking at cooling. Um, so this is a paid from savings model, similar to sort of cooling as a service, um, but looking at refrigerators and trying to substitute um, inefficient refrigerators in, in SMEs. Um, often in convenience stores um, for higher performing products that can pay for themselves very quickly at no capital cost to the customer. Um, so yeah, so three examples of, of work we're doing that we hope can lead to scalable um, yeah, deployment of EE in the future. And then just to wrap up with next steps, so we're continuing our work over the next year. We're hoping that the program will be formally extended, but it looks as if we'll be working all the way until the end of 2022. Um, continuing to do national policy and planning work across the region, um, increasingly doing work on better data, particularly MRV linked to um, uh, tracking targets and policy and, and their success and their, their implementation. Um, we're also expanding our product standards work um, to new countries, um, and we're going to continue with EE finance work in general across the region. So yeah, any questions, very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will, for your presentation. Thank you for sharing some more information on the current status on the Low Carbon Energy Program, as well as case studies. Um, I would like now to introduce uh, Sweden Rumble. Um, Swift is a youth project uh, designer at ADB Youth for Asia. And as part of the Youth, youth for Asia team, he focuses on integrating a meaningful youth engagement into ADB operations, events, and knowledge generation in the urban transport and energy sectors. At ADB, he has worked to consolidate youth participation in road safety intervention and define Youth for Asia's novel approach for engaging young people in the man's side energy sector projects. Thank you, youth. Thank you, Clotilde. 
Uh, yes, I'm Swith from ADB's Youth for Asia, and I believe that the meaningful engagement of youth, those between the ages of 15 and 29, in demand-side energy efficiency programmes can significantly contribute to sustainably and cost-effectively closing the gap between energy supply and energy demand in Asia and the Pacific. Fundamentally, we should explicitly target and engage with youth in the development of their clean energy future, as youth possess unique characteristics and assets which enable them to contribute in distinctive ways. Firstly, youth have shown to be caring and responsible energy citizens in their leadership of global social movements and grassroots activism, rejecting fossil fuels and combating climate change. Despite this, youth are still generally excluded from formal decision-making on the energy transition, forcing them to be resilient and resourceful in achieving their objectives. Along with the freshness of youth thinking, this results in innovative solutions to entrenched energy-related problems. Youth are natural collaborators, and constituting 100% of the future population can help to bring together governments, multilateral development banks, and the grassroots communities. Youth are digitally literate, making them a key resource for piloting new technologies and providing those on the other side of the digital divide with crucial information. Finally, youth are best placed to understand their peers, and so are crucial in collecting behavioral insights from other youth such as on energy consumption and representing youth interests. At Youth for Asia, we promote meaningful youth engagement, which is achieved when under enabling conditions, youth representatives participate throughout the program life cycle and enter into youth adult partnerships. This is about creating a conducive ecosystem in which intergenerational partnerships can thrive and where we can match the passion and assets of a diverse range of youth with the expertise and experience of older generations for the benefit of all across Asia and the Pacific. Applying the principle of meaningful youth engagement to demand side energy efficiency by ensuring youth co-leadership in projects, programs and policies is the only way to ensure the interest and participation of youth in these initiatives, while also contributing to the personal, social and economic development of our future citizens. I now turn to why youth participation is necessary for sustainably managing the gap between energy supply and demand. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. We know that efficiency measures are often the cheapest, cleanest and most accessible energy source for meeting increasing demand in developing countries. In turn, it is the residential sector that can offer some of the easiest and largest gains through technology and behaviour change. Both of these can be positively influenced by the inherent characteristics of youth. However, thus far, Asia and the Pacific has lagged behind other parts of the world, such as North America and Sub-Saharan Africa, in meaningfully engaging communities and young people for the achievement of energy efficiency targets. Firstly, with technology, new devices can be adopted in the household, such as smart meters, or investments can be made to the building structure. Youth have a natural affinity with new technology both in terms of its innovation and in its uptake as consumers. Secondly, behavior change is a particularly useful intervention for developing member countries, as it requires often a minimum monetary investment. This behavior change can be simple, such as turning off appliances, or it can interact with technological change, such as in the informed use of thermostats. Not only are youth generally more receptive to these new concepts, they are also highly accomplished at changing the behaviours of others, including, for instance, through their skillful access to knowledge on the internet and their patterns of engagement with social media. One concrete way to integrate meaningful youth engagement into energy efficiency is through a youth auditing programme. Thank you. A peer-to-peer -peer capacity building initiative targeting youth, followed by a community programme to audit for energy savings in their own households, local businesses, and public facilities could be the key to a scalable model for energy efficiency at the community and the residential level. Integrating practical energy auditing into youth education would not only develop young people's awareness of energy conservation and catalyze further behavior change through their informal interactions with older generations in society, it could also directly and immediately contribute to a substantial reduction in local energy usage through community auditing visits. Another way to support youth-led technological solutions which draw on a nuanced understanding of youth motivations to ensure behavior change is through te technology, 
One such example is uh, Proketa Inutec, a youth-led social enterprise targeting residential energy efficiency in southern India. Hopefully this following video will give you a flavour of the inspiring work already done by youth today in the region. I'm Vaishak, founder of Praketa Inotech Private Limited, a youth-led Indian social enterprise responsible for the design of BEEP, the Behavioral Effective Energy Planner. BEEP is a standalone practical device for understanding real-time residential consumption patterns and changing consumer behavior. It provides accurate and useful data so that all energy consumers have both the information and the motivation to devise their own energy management solutions resulting in cost saving for them and energy savings for the society. To maximize long-term effectiveness, it must understand and be accessible to young people, the primary energy users of the future. With its universal and youth-friendly language, BEEP is able to maximize potential savings, building on the existing climate consciousness of youth to enact an immediate behavioral change. Targeting all energy users, BEEP allows the consumer to realize his forecasted energy bill to a display unit or mobile application, which calculate the rate of energy consumption. Faced with the real-time forecast of the bill that the consumer must pay at the end of the billing period, a behavior change occurs, triggering the users to immediately reduce their energy consumption. Specifically targeting youth, either as energy consumers in the family household or the primary bill payers, we also displays present and forecasted CO2. We believe that this vital information will trigger environmentally concerned users to be more careful about their consumption and reduce their carbon footprint. In terms of the present status of BEEP, the MDB, basic software and mobile application have been developed and now we are working on microfine. Initial studies have clearly shown that with this device, a minimum of 5% of total energy consumption can be reduced per consumer. BEEP is pioneering in its truest sense as it draws on energy expertise and a genuine understanding of the region's youth to catalyze the behavioral change needed for the current and future health of planet Earth. I'm White. Thank you very much, Swift. Um, very good to hear about youth engagement and how this can be instrumental also for energy efficiency projects. I would like now to ask a polling question that will be open also for uh, some time so that you will have time to, to answer it. And um, the polling question is, um, what type of support is most needed in your country for financing energy efficiency improvements? Fiscal measure, taxes, grants and subsidies, research, development and demonstration, training and information, standards, code and labeling, uh, govern direct investment or other. So thank you for uh, sharing your point of view and uh, giving a, us an answer to this question. Um, and uh, now uh, there are a few questions from the audience that we would like to address. Great, so uh, I would like to start with uh, Dina and uh, ask you the questions related to green bonds. So is a, the question is, uh, are green bonds a one-time financial fund to project or a yearly fund? And who is paying for the fund, for this fund? Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Thank you very much audience for asking this. Uh, green bonds uh, for borrowing side works exactly the same as, uh, as conventional bonds. So this is the way to borrow money. Uh, if you go to the bank, bank loan, you basically borrow from one. But if company issues bonds, they borrow from many and they can even borrow from abroad. Yeah, so, that, so that's not a fund. It's a way to borrow. And then issuer prom borrows uh, money today and promises that after some years, let's say five years or something, uh, they will pay some interest or annually. So that, that will be written in the green bond description, how they will pay, how much is the interest rate and everything. Thank you for this question. Thank you very much, Dina. And thank you also, Mayan, for the interesting question. I would like to ask a question now to um, Will. 
And uh, this is relates more to carbon trust and um, what are the activities and how is actually carbon trust um, helping um, support energy efficiency, whether it goes beyond um, capital development and demonstration and uh, more uh, and how about a uh, large scale up of projects. Thank you. Thanks, Clotilde. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I guess there's a couple of things. So you, the pilot project work that we're doing, um, it's mostly with industry. Um, so it tends to require an investment grade audit to identify the opportunities on a plant. Um, and we would normally develop a project from concept through to financing. Um, and we would then leave that project at that point so that the project designer or project developer can, can move ahead with the implementation. And um, the reason for that is purely time. Like we haven't had um, as much time as we would like um, with, with this um, program. Um, so I'd say that any new projects um, that we receive interest in, we can have a look at um, in the context of sort of getting something done in the next 18 months. Um, but we're currently constrained for budget um, and we are constrained in terms of getting through to implementation. And in terms of sort of broader scale up um, or, or other support that businesses could have from our program, um, we have what's called the ASEAN Energy Efficiency Accelerator. There is a well, you can you can Google it. So ASEAN Energy Efficiency Accelerator, um, and we are offering a whole range of services to corporates, um, which are not linked to demonstration projects, but um, include um, yeah audits. Um, they include energy management consultation installation. Um, they include sort of mainstreaming energy efficiency with into a business strategy, um, and and a broader sustainability strategy, um, and a host of other things as well. So yeah, I recommend having a look at that. Um, and just to wrap up, yeah, we, we do offer incubation services in general for taking uh, new technologies, new ideas, um, new models to market, um, but not through our programme in, in ASEAN at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Will, for uh, getting me to this question. Um, Sweet, I would like to ask you more about the youth engagement and um, how can youth engagement um, help countries improve um, their energy efficiency rates? Okay, um, I think that uh, the key here is working with young people um, across Asia and the Pacific, either uh, with governments and or multilateral development banks like ADB uh, to focus on behavior change. I think that's where the biggest energy saving gains can be made with youth engagement. Um, and in terms of getting started immediately, I think that it would be good if young people were included um, or at least consulted when discussing energy strategies, uh, energy efficiency strategies at the national level um, and including these initiatives in energy efficiency strategies and recognizing the importance of the residential sector and behavior change and all these different concepts that I discussed. So I think that's really is the key to um, to starting this, this process of behaviour change across the region and creating this energy conscious next generation. Um, I think it's also good to, to uh, perhaps work with and to draw on the expertise of youth-led organisations in the region as well. Um, there is a interesting and growing precedent of youth-led grassroots um, organizations and initiatives around energy efficiency. So that's a really good way for the government or multilateral development banks like the ADB to get these initiatives started. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your insight and uh, your point of view on that as well. We are almost at time. So uh, I would like to ask, you know, a very small question till to uh, Dina. Um, which relates again to green bonds. So Dina would appreciate a very short answer on your end, which on, is on specific example of um, uh, green bonds and how this can be, um, if you could share any uh, specific example on green bonds and how this can be um, successful instruments for financing energy efficiency improvements in buildings. 
Thank you very much, Clotilde. I will try to be short, although the question is quite uh, long. Yeah, uh, I mean, requires long answer. Uh, for green buildings, usually people imagine like they are full of trees and looking green color, but actually a green building could look like a normal building and you would not know it's green unless you read documents and see that it's a platinum standard or A-level energy efficiency building. So green buildings, they not only include energy efficiency, also water, water savings, energy savings, they can lead to uh, emission reduction. Uh, most of buildings, uh, yeah, like, as I said, uh, you would not see as, a, as when you visit these buildings, but they have some installed, for example, more energy efficient cooling equipment, some insulation uh, and water saving uh, technologies. Uh, there is one building at the National University of Singapore, which impressed me. Uh, among all the green buildings which I visited, uh, because when you enter this building, you can feel you are in low carbon green building uh, because you can see uh, the, the air is flowing, the way it's cooled. So you, you can actually even be without being a specialist, you can notice that this is an energy efficient building. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. I would like to thank all uh, panelists for your insight and for the information you shared. It was, um, thank you so much. And I would like now to introduce uh, the next um, panel and um, Dr. Linda Arthur. So um, uh, Linda is senior specialist at the Asia Development Bank Institute. She works with government officials by designing knowledge products to strengthen policy making and implementing across a range of um, priority areas for developing and emerging Asia. She's a contact from the ADB, where she has worked since 2003 in various positions, including field assignment in Afghanistan and Pakistan. She holds a PhD from Oxford University and an MA and a BA from the University of Toronto. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much, Clotilde. Hello and welcome to session two. Here we're going to showcase country experiences in promoting and implementing effective energy uh, efficiency initiatives to increase private investments in efficiency improvements and achieve national energy efficiency targets. Um, just uh, wanted to give you a bit of information on this 3% uh, club. Uh, some of you may be wondering what it is, and uh, I think it's a great name for it. It uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, creates sort of <laughs> this mystery about a 3% club, but but its partners work with governments to coordinate the deployment of energy efficiency uh, solutions uh, with the goal of accelerating the rate of energy efficiency improvement to 3% per year, hence the name 3% Club. And 3% is actually the rate needed to meet the Paris climate goals and achieve sustainable energy for all. So that's the 3% Club. And now I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. We have three panelists today um, coming from three countries. The first is Dr. Sardar Mohassan. He's the Managing Director of the uh, National Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority in Pakistan. He has served as advisor with public sector, academia, and international development partners. He is proactively involved in restructuring and institutionalization of energy efficiency, as well as climate change mitigation NDCs at national and provincial level. Ms. Yvonne So is the executive director of the Singapore Green Building Council, which is an industry organization founded on a strong public-private partnership to drive the transformation of Singapore's built environment. Her work experience spans both the public and private sector. She's passionate about driving corporate action on climate change and the development of programs to motivate and sustain a virtuous cycle of action. Mr. Wang Van Tam is the Deputy Head of Climate Change and Green Growth Office under the Steering Committee's Ministry of Industry and Trade, um, Vietnam. He is working on climate change and green growth for the energy and industry sector. He's been in charge of working on various topics related to the national program on energy efficiency, 
developing and updating NDCs development for energy sectors and NDCs implementation mechanisms such as carbon pricing, carbon crediting instruments and emission trading. So let's start then with a uh, brief presentation by Dr. Mahasam and uh, then we'll follow with uh, Ms. Yvonne So and then Mr. Wang Van Tan. And Dr. Mohasan, you have five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I'd just like to focus on uh, with this presentation on uh, Pakistan's strategic plan for 2020-2023 and some of its alignment with post-COVID-19 recovery. Next slide, please. So it's just like uh, I just wanted to highlight a bit of context, like where Pakistan comes from, uh, the energy efficiency context and how and when we moved forward with that. I think it's, it's worth mentioning here that Pakistan started this whole energy efficiency and conservation as an autonomous agency, which was established in 1985. And 1985-86 onward, there has been consistently efforts uh, in, in this area. And uh, there was a serious efforts being put in place in 2006 with the legal cover provided uh, by passing an act of parliament and then an established an authority for national energy efficiency and conservation. So uh, I think over these years, there were some times when uh, there was work going on, but in some times there was a bit of dormancy in that area. In 2020 and 19 was the time that uh, we took over and the new government came in into the, uh, the office. And uh, I started preparing uh, with my team and uh, at National Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority, in the national um, strategic plan for 2020 and 2023. And then I think afterwards, uh, this strategic plan, we have set a goal for three MTOE of energy saving from the primary energy supply. Till date, the number of initiatives where we just started and where we are right now in terms of policy formulation and revision, setting up the whole HR structure, which was not available earlier in this authority, and some of the operational and developmental expenditure from the government's own financing has been secured. And still, we are moving forward with some of these achievements, which I will be reflected, which will be reflected in this presentation. Next slide, please. So, uh, as per the act and uh, as per the mandate of NICA, uh, I think this is something we have been working and that has been reflected through the strategic plan, which is in place that we have a saving goal for three MTOE out of the base 89 MTOE. And then we have divided it in diff different sectors, which is actually the mandate that comes from the act, uh, which covers, provides the legal background to the Pakistan. So in, in this regard, we have the industrial sector, we have buildings, we have transport, the whole power and petroleum sector, and then the agriculture sector. So in each and every sector, along with the goal being set, which totals to three MTOE, there are a set of initiatives that has been also highlighted. And currently we have been working on some of these, but I, I must say that the strategic plan sets it out the whole uh, efforts in terms of uh, three phases, which I would like to highlight more. Uh, if you go to next slide, please. The, so this is, uh, we have divided it into three phases, institutionalization phase, operationalization phase, and then the implementation. So as of now, the institutionalization process has completed. The strategic plan, the HR um, structuring, 
and number of other initiatives which are uh, especially setting up the standards for LEDs, motors, some of the awareness campaigns, the whole legal framework around it, even at a provincial level, setting up the designated agencies and processes around it. So I must say that we have been able to successfully complete. And now we are moving towards the next stage where we are going to operationalize some of the budgets from the government has been allocated and other developmental funds are available. And lastly, I think the true implementation, once these things are in place, some of initiatives have already started, such as the audits of captive power plants and some other appliances who are currently in voluntarily regime, but we will be taking up and making them mandatory. So these are the areas moving forward we will see a lot more potential. I think one of the area where we see a lot, you know, interest in energy saving certificates, some of these distribution transformers and across the board interventions where we will be focusing on in our implementation stage. But overall, I think this is where we are heading for with our clear cut strategy and goals that what we want to achieve and this is a quantifiable goal, ambitious goal of 3MTOE. Next. So Nika also sits at a very interesting, uh, you know, point where it interacts and has play uh, its role with the Ministry of Energy, but also it uh, has a strong collaboration and uh, take a strong lead on climate change mitigation. So Nika's strategic plan sets out three MTUE saving, which also translates into uh, CO2 emissions reductions. Uh, if we have been also instrumental, uh, this organization and government of Pakistan has been working on NDC's revision, where we have done uh, good work on mitigation uh, and work has been completed. And I think shortly there will be announcements on that as well. Number of other uh, third or second national communications and biannual reports and all these areas have been already addressed. But I must say that this close collaboration where we are not only uh, seeing at energy efficiency, but also its effect on the mitigation, which are also reflected in NDCs. This is also one of the top priority at National Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is the challenges and the barriers. I think currently what we are facing, lack of capacity to undertake projects related to energy efficiency. Uh, there are lack of, you know, uh, international partners efforts. So far we have experienced to extend support for energy efficiency in systems and operations because earlier there were challenges of large scale energy uh, shortages electricity, but now I think this has changed. The whole energy landscape is changing and there is more potential to look into this area as well. And I think upgradation of industries and lack of funds or resources to optimize industrial processes to, and their awareness is a very important thing. And I think uh, there is a huge potential, which is a challenge as well as an opportunity to develop ESCO's market and then and developing the whole mechanisms around energy savings, certificates of the green bonds, which has not been taken up very well, maybe in some areas, but this is the uh, provides an, a great opportunity to work in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohasam. Great to know that uh, Pakistan is uh, on it and uh, uh, especially on the uh, mitigation side. Excellent. And let me now move to um, Yvonne So. She will be presenting a few slides for you. Uh, Ms. So, you have five minutes. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, and a very good day to everyone. Um, so energy efficiency is a key pillar of Singapore's green building programs and also a key feature of our long-term low emission development strategy. Uh, it's a key mitigation measure for Singapore to achieve our NDC targets, though I must add that this is not a recent uh, development, 
born out of our climate change commitments, but rather an ongoing continuous process that began a long time ago in uh, 1979 to be exact. So uh, in that year, Singapore developed our first codes to address energy use in buildings. And these were implemented through the building control regulations. The scope of the regulations included aspects such as the thermal performance of building facades and envelope, as well as uh, the energy efficiency of building equipment, such as for air conditioning and lighting. So since 1979, the regulations and guidelines have been reviewed and updated a number of times with new requirements introduced to keep up with the changing needs of the industry and users, as well as to strengthen its overall effectiveness. So some of the codes and standards that were introduced back then and that are still being used today include those on uh, the envelope thermal performance for buildings, the energy efficiency standard for building services and equipment, the code of practice for air conditioning and mechanical ventilation in buildings, as well as uh, that for the lighting of workplaces. These codes and standards, uh, they form part of the prescriptive compliance requirements for the submission of building plans under Singapore's Building Control Act and regulations. So fast forward to 2005, in 2005, a big shift that really propelled energy efficiency and the environmental sustainability of buildings to the forefront is the introduction of the Green Mark Scheme by the Building and Construction Authority. It started off as a purely voluntary scheme to recognize industry leadership, but uh, legislation was subsequently introduced in 2008 to require a minimum environmental performance level for new buildings. This was then followed up with additional requirements for existing buildings in 2012 to require owners of commercial buildings to submit their building energy data, as well as to carry out energy audits periodically. So together, these measures have helped the energy use in buildings to fall over time on a per square meter basis even as uh, the total building floor space in Singapore expanded over that time with uh, increased economic activity. Uh, so next slide, please. So moving to today, 2021, this year, the Building and Construction Authority and the Singapore Green Building Council as a joint public-private sector effort co-created and launched a refreshed um, green Building Master Plan to get our buildings to 2030. So this plan seeks to achieve three outcomes in 2030. Firstly, we are working towards 80% of Singapore's buildings to be green by 2030. This target is not new and it has been in place since about uh, 10 years ago. We are now about 43% into our greening journey. Secondly, from 2030 onwards, 80% uh, of our new buildings must be super low energy. And by super low energy, what this means is that buildings will need to be at least 60% more energy efficient than our buildings were in 2005. Thirdly, in 2030, we are working towards our best in class buildings to be at least 80% more energy efficient. So we can achieve this uh, technological leap only with greater support from and investment in uh, research, development, and innovation. Um, so in conclusion, you would have noticed the continued emphasis on the energy efficiency of buildings in the definition of Singapore green building. Energy efficiency remains the linchpin of our environmental strategy for buildings in Singapore, and it is a guiding principle that has not wavered since 1979. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you, and back to you, Linda. Thank you very much, Ms. So, and uh, very good to know that uh, Singapore, with its usual efficiency, has, uh, you know, highlighted some very ambitious targets uh, by 2030, and uh, I'm sure uh, it will make great strides in reaching those. Next, we have Mr. Huang Van Tam, and I think you are also sharing a few slides today. You have five minutes. Please go ahead.
Uh, I so, should say uh, that Mr. Tom much. is having, yeah, sorry, Mr. Tom, I just wanted to remind everyone that you, I think you're having some problems with, uh, okay, I think your audio has been uh, corrected, so please go ahead. Yes, okay, also thank you, it's better when I turn off my comments and for better connection, so uh, thank you, Linda, and good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, uh, so uh, today I'm very happy to Enjoy the interesting event and to share with the uh, the uh, our national uh, energy efficiency policy, and in the in terms of, uh, uh, of the, the way to the address the climate target and um, and the, the energy implementation in in our country. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, for today, uh, I think with a limited time, so I'd like to provide you a very overall generation of the uh, energy efficiency uh, regulation. And we, and then I would like to focus on uh, something about the, our estimation about the business assets of any consumption uh, by next 10 years. And in line with the, our plan to address the climate uh, action to uh, to implement the NDC in Vietnam and uh, some showing something about the energy saving potential for industry by some uh, current uh, current analysis about the uh, uh, possible potential of the energy saving in some key industry in, in our country next slide please Uh, for the uh, overall on the energy efficiency policy, uh, so I think that Vietnam is one of the countries we have uh, very soon to approve uh, the law on energy efficiency in 2010. And uh, with the 10 years implementation of the law, we have uh, 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 regulations uh, from the government degree to prime minister decision and uh, some very very specific uh, circular of the rice military, including the MOIT military industry and trade. Uh, for the law, under the law, we have uh, the government degree for the guidance, very detailed guidance of the implementation, uh, the law implementation. And uh, we we now have uh, the degree on the violation to for the any uh, violation on energy efficiency in Vietnam now, and uh, so I think that uh, this degree should be improved because we want to uh, more compliance of the uh, regulation in the coming times so we in line to push up the, how to reduce the energy demands in our country to address the, the anything related to the energy security and, uh, um, uh, and the climate uh, target of the country committed uh, in the NDC in, in Vietnam, uh, for under the law, we now have uh, many prime minister decisions. For I think that we now uh, we have been running many program approved by the prime minister decision for the uh, energy labeling. Uh, we now in, in the market in Vietnam, we, we have seen that many many uh, energy labeling uh, label in in the electric city equipment. Uh, uh, in, in the market, you can see the five stars or to from the uh, three star to four five stars. Uh, you can uh, for the customer they can uh, choose the which one is better. And most of uh, the uh, market in, in uh, now we are left with uh, five stars. And for the prime minister decision uh, on the designated energy utilities, it means that we have a list of the intensive energy consumption in, uh, in that for industry and uh, different uh, economic sector uh, approved by the prime minister annually. And uh, this, by this, uh, the, the prime minister, uh, uh, um, the prime minister's decision, we, we have a lot of supervisor prison, uh, super, supervision plan for them and they have to report uh, energy consumption uh, activity uh, uh, timely for, for the government and the militaries. Uh, and, and now in the, in the country, we have the prime minister decision about the roadmap for phasing out the low efficiency technology 
and machine oriented in, in the whole country with deep in the focusing on some uh, uh, heavy industry, for example, in for the power sector and for uh, some different types of the, uh, the engines and motor with a low efficient energy consumption, they, they have to uh, see the signal for the government to facing out everything in, in our countries in the next uh, 10 years. Uh, so now we are setting up uh, a lot of the minimum energy performance standards for the sub industry sector so far. Uh, this, uh, up to now, we have uh, at least uh, six uh, sub industry sector we have set up, setting up the uh, maps. Here. You can see in the screen about chemicals, palm paper, steel, seafood processing, sugar, sugar, and plastic. And now we are going to uh, complete. Uh, uh, another uh, map uh, for other subsector industry for in the next uh, in the program on, on the national program on energy efficiency uh, uh, during 2019 and 2030. Okay, you can see the VNIP, uh, number three in the screen now, and we are running this program uh, in the continuation in the different uh, past of the two national target program we have done. Uh, have been done to, uh, since 2006 and 2015. Um, for the now, we we think that uh, we are keep continuing that uh, the national program on energy star and communication uh, and market management for higher efficient electronic equipment. And uh, I think that now we are in the uh, energy efficiency. We have. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, policy and regulation on that, and now we are improving on the way of improving this uh, the regulation and hope to see the uh, more comprehensive uh, uh, government uh, regulation in the coming times. We will align with, with the, our uh, national security, uh, energy efficiency, and the commitment of the Paris Agreement in the coming times. The next slide, please. Yes, okay, right, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Okay, so, so next, uh, next slide, please, I can go quickly. Uh, as for the next slide, you can see that uh, um, the hour, you can see that in the, the growing of uh, up the our energy demand from, from the whole country, as most of the uh, energy uh, consumption account uh, uh, for for the industry, we take into account about uh, for, uh, half of the energy consumption, uh, final energy uh, consumption in in the country, and and so uh, I think that with uh, more of the uh, the the energy savings potential in the next slides uh, we will present now. Uh, okay, next slide, please. I can focus on that. You can see that. Uh, different sub-industry sector with the high potential for energy efficiency uh, from different types of technology. That's why we now are working with the different partners and development partners to implement uh, and promote and uh, speed up our energy support activities in our country. So now we have uh, today, I think we have uh, William with now working with the, uh, the his program on low energy efficiency uh, program in Asia. And now we are speeding up uh, different types of uh, and, and, uh, energy saving uh, for uh, different, uh, you can see in, 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 in the screen with a heavy industry from iron, plastic and beverage and some uh, paper building materials for kind of cement sector and some other with different types of um, uh, technology, energy efficiency technology analysis and we can see them here and okay that's uh we're gonna go to there uh, i think that's uh, with thumbs up we now we hope that uh you can see um we have more time uh, to uh to, to work uh, for the cooperation in the q a session so sorry for the uh, we have uh, i have to stop up uh, stop here to uh Hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Wang, for sharing uh, sharing the developments in Vietnam. Um, 
I would like to now do a lightning round of questions. Uh, we're, we're behind time. So if each speaker, each panelist could just respond and try to keep it to one minute, uh, that would be appreciated because there are also questions from the audience. Now, if I can uh, start with uh, Dr. Mahazam, what are the barriers for setting and achieving ambitious energy efficiency targets? Please go ahead. I, I think, uh, thank you for the question. I think I've already highlighted some of these, uh, you know, the barriers when we were working in that direction, that uh, especially the capacities at national level and especially the partnership which needed in terms of with the private sector or with internationally, that's currently has been seen uh, in the developing world that when there is a high demand for energy, and then how much we see the, the potential for energy efficiency at the same time. So this comes up with, uh, you know, the, there are priorities, but which one is needed first? And the access to energy becomes a big, big priority. So overall, this context of understanding, like which is the first fuel, that gives us a challenge, like, okay, the energy should be available first, and then the access should be the secondary thing. And again, uh, there is this understanding that how there are the co-benefits and how it will the energy intensity will help. So awareness, capacity building, and then this whole collaboration around it, that how effectively energy efficiency can be mobilized and useful, I think, and embedded into the overall governance and institutional frameworks, that also at some extent gives us uh, brings us to this challenges and barriers for the implementation and moving forward in that direction. Thank you, Dr. Mahazam. Certainly, uh, it takes a village, so many moving parts. Um, let me now move to Ms. So. Uh, could you tell us what the main motivation is for applying for Green Mark certification in Singapore? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. So um, I think we can start by first looking at what uh, green bonds look for. Uh, so green bonds generally aim to mobilize uh, capital for positive environmental or climate friendly investments. Um, so the ability to define environmental additionality and to also have the means to monitor and verify performance in a transparent manner would be very important. So most established green building rating tools are able to fulfill that function. And the green mark is uh, definitely one of them where the standard also goes one step further by requiring that uh, permanent instrumentation be installed for critical uh, building systems. So this is to ensure that the measurement and verification of building performance can be undertaken, not just at the completion of the building project, but will also be an uh, ongoing practice throughout the building's operations and lifespan. Um, so the other thing we want to do also is to ensure that emissions reductions are sufficiently deep. And in Singapore, a basic standard level of environmental sustainability has already been embedded into building regulations. So the green mark certification goes beyond that basic improvement level with the added performance targets all well defined. And on top of it, a green mark platinum building would represent the best in class uh, buildings that can be achieved with uh, today's technologies. So I believe these are probably some of the factors contributing to the popular uh, popularity of green mark standard, uh, you know, in Singapore as well as in uh, the application for green bonds. Yep, thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that. I think there are further questions uh, for you from the audience, but uh, first let me turn to uh, Mr. Wang. And uh, I wonder if you can tell us, do you think international collaboration can help set and achieve national energy efficiency targets? If you could just answer in uh, quickly in one minute, thanks. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, Linda, for your question. So, uh... Uh, yes, uh, I, I think that uh, yes, okay. So we we now uh, we are cooperate with the international uh, partners in in our country to uh, implement and to support our national program on energy efficiency 
uh, I think that we now with a combination between the national uh, budget and national capacity to, to combine with international support, we speed up uh, our VNIP uh, number three program. So now I think that uh, uh, it's a very good approach uh, to help the country, developing country, to, uh, to very soon to ad address the energy efficiency target. Uh, and to support them in implementation of the Paris Agreement uh, in the realistic. And now we are, we think that we are not only working with the UK government and with a different partner from the World Bank and ADB, some other organization, we work together in, in terms of energy efficiency program in, in our country. We think that uh, we have better uh, cooperation uh, with, with them in, in, in now, so I think that's a very good approach for that. And thank you very everyone for support us in the uh, energy efficiency program in the country. Thank you. Uh, some some technical issues. Uh, I, I I haven't. I'm fine. Thank you. you very much. Um, oh, okay. Thanks, That's Mr. Good. Wang. Sorry, I had a, a microphone issue there. But uh, uh, now I'd like to move to the questions from the audience, actually. And um, for Ms. So, Singapore has been the leader in green buildings. How were you able to prescribe maximum energy use intensity per type of building? For example, hotel, hospital, office buildings. And how do you ensure compliance to this? This is a question from Teresa Lapus. Yep, uh, thanks for that question. So we've been, um, earlier I was mentioning that there has been laws in place to require the submission of building energy data. So because of that, we've been able to uh, obtain benchmarks for different types of buildings. So I think that has been very uh, critical in uh, giving us really good insights into what would be a good performance level and then how do we go about setting higher targets? Yeah. Okay, excellent. And uh, there's actually a, um, a follow-on question. Uh, so why does Singapore define super low energy buildings rather than net zero buildings? That's a question from yeah. Verena Stratford. Yes, thank you for that question. So um, earlier on, I was actually speaking from the perspective of the building sector. So building energy efficiency is something definitely within the, di uh, the direct design control and operational management of the built environment sector. Uh, in Singapore, we are taking a multi-sectoral and integrated approach to reducing our carbon emissions. So to get to net zero, the building sector will be working with the energy and power generation sector and they will be uh, focusing efforts on, um, for example, decarbonizing Singapore's power grid, building up solar capacity, uh, tapping on regional power grids, um, yeah, and looking into other low carbon solutions and alternatives. Yep, so it's a very holistic approach and uh, for the building sector, all we can do is to just get our buildings to be more energy efficient. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, there's. Uh, another question here, it's not really, uh, again from Teresa Lapus, it's not really directed to anyone in particular, but because energy efficiency projects are considered risky, ESCOs are still not given concessional interest rates by banks. Collateral requirements are also stiff. How can this be addressed? Anyone, please jump in. I'll just, uh, you know, in the context of uh, Pakistan, maybe I can highlight it. Yes, these are the real challenges when we are going for, you know, scaling up uh, in terms of energy efficiency and uh, there are nascent markets maybe in that case as well. So I think the central banks can also play a very important role. International financial institutions can uh, play an important role that how to establish these kind of, you know, concessional or a blended finance uh, available for these ESCOs or some of these companies to come and play its role for energy efficiency. Most of the times, uh, financing for big ticket items where you know you have a whole kind of uh, systems available, financing is available, collaterals are there, financing is much easier. But these kind of uh, interventions where energy efficiency, which is widespread, 
there are more jobs but i think it's it seems really risky so i think the policy leverage from the government side and financial institutions they are the only ones who can help bail us, bail this thing out from this whole challenges thank you thank you dr prahasam i think yes the critical role of of government there and financial institutions we are almost at the end of time here uh, we have just a minute and i just wanted to ask uh, if the polling uh, result can be put up on the screen i'll just remind you of what the question was uh, was what type of support is most needed in your country for financing energy efficiency improvements and uh, hopefully you can see the responses but fiscal measures came out at the top um uh, by a lot actually. And then uh, it's training and information and standards, codes, and labeling following that. So uh, critical role for the government, again, obviously in fiscal measures and taxes, but also for uh, setting standards. Um, and then a role for uh, academia, uh, think tanks, and um, also in partnership with government for training and information. Um, the, the others, which uh, certainly featured, but uh, not, as, not as many people selected grants and subsidies and uh, also government direct investment. So with that, I don't, I don't see um, any other questions, but uh, we are out of time here. So I would like to uh, thank again, our panelists for their excellent presentations and responses to the questions, Dr. S uh, Sadar Mahazam, Ms. Yvonne So, and Mr. Wang Van Tam. Thank you very much. And thank you to our audience for, uh, for your attention today and your interest in the topic. Now I would like to hand it over to Claude Tilde for closing remarks. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, let me join you also in thanking your panelists and thank you for the insights shared and the discussion. Um, so we heard today, we understand that energy efficiency is at the core of our sustainable future and is crucial for the development of the Asia and Pacific region. Increases in energy efficiency can help Asia and the Pacific drive economic growth and meet energy access goals while decreasing emissions. Energy efficient enhancement can be instrumental in reducing the demand for fossil fuel and related greenhouse gas emission. It can also keep countries on low carbon track as they develop and as they recover after the COVID-19 pandemic. We heard today in the first panel discussion about the importance of energy efficiency in building and industry and financing option of energy efficiency projects through green bonds. We heard about the importance of any, having an energy efficiency ecosystem to drive energy efficiency at scale and how youth engagement can play an important role when mindset and behavioral changes are necessary. In the second panel discussion, we just heard about the importance of international partnerships such as the 3% Club to set ambitious goal to achieve SDG 7. We heard about the role of governments in developing and implementing energy efficiency plans, about Pakistan and Vietnam energy efficiency strategies and Singapore green buildings targets. So partnerships such as the 3% Club can help advocate for energy efficiency in global agendas, creating a clear narrative for energy efficiency, and they can help deliver strategic support and technical assistance in countries on key issues for high impact sectors can deliver project um, implementation through loans, grants, and incentives for infrastructure and projects. Now, in these special times and in the post-COVID times, governments around the world have a unique opportunity to support energy efficiency to help with their economic recovery. Investment in energy efficiency would help them recover better. And this could create, according to the International Energy Agency, as much as 35% of new jobs. And many countries in Asia Pacific have set national energy efficiency targets, stringent policy and financial tools are necessary and needed to properly enhance the market support 
supporting energy efficient technologies and services in order to achieve national goals. Thank you for your participation today. Thank you to the distinguished panelists and to the Asia Development Bank and Asia Development Bank Institute for co-hosting today's workshop and have a great day.